Good evening. It's a pleasure to have you all here uh, for the first lecture of the year. Um, in a way, this lecture is the first one of this year, but it's also um, the last one of the last. Uh, somehow we couldn't manage to schedule Tom to speak officially under the 50th anniversary, but he managed anyway um, to get to, to that because and he told me he's going to be talking about 50 years of work. So, um, Tom May times 50. I have to confess there's only 48 there. Uh, I couldn't make it fit the exact 50. It didn't look good. So it's 48 there, but let's run out on 48. Um, I think there is something to be said about Tom May times 50. Because one could argue that there are 50 domains. Not 50 domains because he has 50 personalities. It's because the amount of work and his presence everywhere that architecture has something to say, he's there. So I always wonder how is that he managed that. But also, there is 50 domains in the sense, I'm not going to go through 50, but there is the curious domain, the heroic domains, the generous domains, the polemic domain, the Tom Main who argues, uh, doesn't matter if you're an 18-year-old newcomer to the school or an established architect, he will argue with you one-to-one, um, -one, which is, a, is I, I always think, is the ultimate sign of respect. There is the excited Tom Main. There is nobody who is more excited to say, oh, thesis reviews are coming. It's going to be fantastic three days. Um, I cannot think of anybody who gets more excited to see new ideas, student work, and so on. There is the non-filter domain, and there is a filter domain. There is the domain who like to always generate groups and conversation. And of course, there is the resilient and the dreamer domain. The other thing that comes to mind when I think about Tom, which I have the pleasure to know for many, many years, I met him in 92 in Argentina. And it was an extraordinary moment for me at that time to meet somebody who had that level of passion and commitment of energy and radical ideas. And this is a time when he was already an established figure, but he hasn't achieved yet the professional success that he will achieve later in life. And I have to say, he hasn't changed in that sense. I met him again in 98 in New York, and somehow he remembered that we met before in Argentina. And he told me, if you're in LA, come and find me. And I did, and we have the beginning of many, 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 many conversations. One would think that somebody like Tom Main would qualify what some other people would say, workaholic. I'm not a psychiatrist, so I cannot talk about addictions. But I wonder if there's such thing as a good addiction. And in that case, I would argue that Tom Main is a good addict to architecture and design. And he's always trying to find new horizons. Now he's in a new version of himself, working in drawings and three-dimensional drawings at almost work of art, work of art. And that will be the next iteration of it. So when you build a career that long, it's impossible that you do it without roughing feathers. But I think that's the job of an architect. I think that's the job of somebody who practices in culture. I will say also that Tomain, as everybody knows, is a funder of the school, a funder of SIARC, one of the funders of SIARC, and he's a quintessential Angelino architect with all the things that it means. So there is a whole series of parallel relationships that you cannot think of Los Angeles the last 50 years without thinking of Tom Main. But you cannot think about the last 50 years about architecture without thinking of Tom Main. Um, Whatever you stand in relation to his work, the work can never be ignored. It can never be ignored because his commitment to the power of architecture is always to the maximum strength. And that's what I was talking about, if there is such thing as a possible addiction, something that you cannot live without it. And it's clearly that Tom cannot live without architecture, and architecture cannot live without Tom Main. I can go many more times. I think this is like the eighth or ninth time that I get to introduce Tom. So it's always an interesting challenge because there are certain people that, you know, like David Letterman show on Netflix, some people who don't need introduction. 
So he's one of them. That's been said, it still needs to be done. And it's always a pleasure to get to see um, the labor of work, the labor of love of 50 years. Now, 50 years, depends how you see it, it's a long time and a short time. I'm 54, so I was a little kid when you started to do this. But if you think in the whole context of the planetarian time, it's just a blink of an eye. So architecture is complex in that sense because architecture will be way longer on this earth and his architecture will be longer in this air than any of us will be on it. So the notion of time is a complex one when they come to architecture. But at the same time, it's always refreshing to see somebody who's been doing it for so long and so well, that remain committed to the notion of now. And if you look at his car, his license plate is now, um, for whatever that means. So, Please join me to welcome the heart-stopping, heart-rocking, earthquaking, justifying, resilient, relentless, passionate, irreverent Tom Main. Actually, using a, a time clock. You know, John Leibner gave a lecture, one of his last sessions here, and I, I think it, Michael, we were just talking about it. I think it was for five hours or something. <laughs> I promise not to do that. And, but I need this thing um, starting. Huh. Oh, it's going backwards. One minute. You can see I'm a big tech guy, right? <laughs> um, there we go. Hernan, um, really be beautiful. Um, thank you so much. Um, you missed some of the characteristics. I was waiting for the, the, the punchline, the, the, the pain in the ass part. Um, <laughs> But thank you so much. <laughs> the, um, this has been uh, it's a really interesting opportunity. And that it, for the last couple of weeks uh, to put this together, I'm literally kind of looking at my life in the last 50 years. And it started with the beginning of the school. And I was um, one of the characters that was, was, was a part of this. And, and with that came uh, the beginning of my firm. And Mike Rotundi is right in front of me here. And he was my first partner. And, I'm one of the two people teaching here that started with Jim Stafford and Michael was one of the students. And then we worked for just about two decades together. And at some, I was mentioning to Tom a minute ago that um, I started a firm in the most kind of odd way. And Michael, you're gonna smile through this whole thing, but you could only do um, what you did when you're somewhat naive and overly optimistic. And, I've got John in right in front of me, and there's a lot of people here that got to kind of smile. That go, of course, that we're we're starting something with no clients and just kind of a vision of doing something. And um, but because of that, um, it, it starts a certain kind of thinking that I'm realizing as I look back that um, you're asking questions and you're struggling in a certain way, and you're asking really basic questions because instead of coming out of a um, of doing an internship or working with an established group, you're starting from scratch and you're asking very basic kind of questions. And then with that comes um, a struggle is to survive. And um, I'm talking to a group of people that, that students here, that you're, you're, you're gonna begin your careers and um, you're gonna find very soon that, that, that there's gonna be an intersection between your um, ambitions and your desires and your drives artistically while you're an architect and really simple needs of survival. And it's going to be a constant kind of alignment of those two things, the misalignment that you're going to be struggling with, but it has a huge amount to do with how you establish your conceptual objections in my, in my case. I've, um, huh, that was, that was 
That was yours, dude. <laughs> I, I've, I've organized this, and it had a little bit to do with even kind of just the last kind of touches I've been here with the, the, the thesis reviews and a, and a round table I went to and um, discussing kind of the whole notion of kind of what is architecture today, et cetera. And I've um, put, put together kind of four territories that are, I think, are kind of essential to how we talk about architecture. And um, material and making, um, nature and ground, which is really going to be performance, and, and today it'll be about environmental sustainability, et cetera. Context, connection, relationships, the, the, the rootedness of architecture in the broadest sense, not just urban context, but broad social, cultural, political, economic kind of thinking of, of how this works. And then organization and form, which would be, um, I say it to the end purposely, what you might kind of focus on as young people, the, the formal, right? And I put it at the end purposely because um, in my experience, um, it's a very complicated subject and it, it doesn't precede the work. It tends to come out of an understanding of how you establish the problem. Or mm, it can precede the work and it's a very delicate mix of the relationship of a formal structure, which is something that you're, you've developed in, in, that's coming from you isolated from the project and the alignment with the project is, is seen by um, society, is seen by the world in terms of how architecture participates. <clears throat> and in, in, in the best of sense, if it can, it can somehow shape or change the, the nature of, of, of how we live. Um, the beginning, the beginning with material, uh, both uh, the beginning of our work had to do with very basic notions of um, the most, I guess, essential notion of an architect. We concretize things. We, 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 we put them within a formal structure and then we put them in material form and we, we it, it's endless the amount of kind of information that could go in there, but it's essentially the nature of the, the world in, in, in every sense. And uh, I was hugely, and then I should say too that Huge amount of my learning. Um, I'm not an academic. I'm actually uh, kind of an a-academic. I'm dyslexic. Um, it never, never suited me. I kind of learned by experience and looking at experiencing, etc. And the academic part came through being an architect through time and this people I met and my colleagues, etc. And, and it, it kind of forced me into into a more, a more classical academic notion. But for me, the, the experience we started with this direct experience, and I walked into Henderson and Ingalls years ago. And I bought this thing called Diderot, and I became just fascinated with the notion of his, his encyclopedia of objects. And, and it opened me up to a kind of an idea of the intelligence of objects. And I'm still at the same place. I'm fascinated with the nature of reading things through a, a visual and a haptic sense. And it's the, the basis of what I, what I do every day, that I'm, 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 I'm interested in the, um, where that takes you allows you to see the world in a somewhat different way, right? When you, and it's, it's its own uh, in the art form. It's unique in the arts. It allows you to experience things in, in physical terms and through movement, et cetera. And then with that came very simple, direct experiences. So um, whether I'm in uh, the Basilica in, in Istanbul and I'm just overtaken by an idea of atmosphere and a notion of not visual, formal, but the, the broader notion of material and tactility and atmosphere, or, or whether it's uh, just recently, I mean, um, I'm in, in Sicily, I'm in, in, in San Cataldo, and it's just uh, the, the power of the materiality um, is just so, so powerful, uh, separate from its formal notion whatsoever. And again, um, very early on, I was, um, I was visiting Solent's museum, and I was just completely affected by the density and the, the layering and the, the, of, the, of, the, of the nature of that, that kind of environment. It had such a huge effect on me. And it's all going to be kind of odd. I'm not interested in looking at things and copying them. I'm just in the, the qualities of things and then bring those qualities forward. And I'm somewhat suspicious of anything kind of literal. And so we're, we're beginning. And um, the, the problem we'd have, of course, like you'll have, is um, finding work. And I'm mm, kind of a socially misfit in some ways. And 
I was an incredibly clever of finding clients, and well, Michael did all that. And um, uh, we're getting little jobs, and we're surviving. And we're trying to locate architecture. And the work we're doing, we work a lot of you'll do. It's a cafe or a shop, or this little work that you start when you start out. And I had, um, I guess, to cut it short, a somewhat 60s sensibility at that particular time in my life. And, wasn't at all interested in the commercial aspects of the work, and I wasn't interested in the day-to-day -day kind of notion. I was trying to understand how does an architect participate in these jobs that can locate architecture and can, and can be somehow autonomous or can be aligned between both things, be autonomous and support the simple, and they're again, very, very simple kind of notions you're dealing with. And it, it, it led us to, um, elements and pieces of things, and that led us to kind of rethinking construction and the notion of materials and we were exploring and learning kind of how to make things, right? And, and that continued for quite a while, so we're looking at a, a cafe, and what they really interested us with this object, and it's a fascinating, and Mike, you remember dealing with Marilyn Lewis, and she's asking us what this thing does, and we said it does everything. It's the reason we're here, right? And um, um, Actually, we kind of, for some reason, pulled it off. And at the time, it was worth three BMWs. I'll never forget. We were talking about it. And she said, my God, this thing's three BMWs. I said, well, yeah, that's whatever, <laughs> right? And we're, 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 we're fighting for our, um, we're fighting for the um, controlling our creative capital. And we're fighting for some sort of ownership of what it means to be an architect and to protect that creative capital. And we're, um, we're very, very involved in craftsmanship and making and in labor, right? And, um, and we are aware of the, um, the shoddiness, the complete disinterest in making things by the people that make things, the building community. No interest, it's about capital, right? And we're aware of that, that we're approaching this and we have to take responsibility for making this stuff, right? Michael's like it's yesterday, right? With us, right? And um, and and it's strange enough. Ten years later, the same client who was complaining it um, completely understood it because it had to do with memorability. People always remember this place through this one thing, right? And it was something that was unique and completely specific, and um, it was it was in fact the most important thing in the project. And then years later, it was something a little more kind of. Um, maybe uh, kind of socially or culturally kind of relevant. We're working on the, uh, the dialysis, the, the, the cancer clinic at Cedar sinai and it's, a, it's, it's pediatric um, um, oncology. And we're building a piece of this that's gonna be a, a kid stage and a place that's very much to do with a, um, a new thinking and treatment of young people with, with various forms of cancer. And it's also because of the, um, the pragmatics that's gonna be underground and we built a, this, this piece that left the landscape on the ground that allowed you to understand that you're just moving at a different level because it was very detrimental to think you're going under the ground in this, in this kind of situation. And we were also um, kind of hunkering down on kind of the intensification, the kind of density of something. That we, 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 we put a certain amount of energy, which is gonna actually end up being capital cost for the construction in, in certain pieces of the building and others are left somewhat benign. And this is gonna stay with us. It's gonna get institutionalized in the studio and it's gonna stay with us for, for a long time. And that's, mm. so we can look at pieces of buildings now and it absolutely goes back to this era. And I think it also has to do with, um, there's a handmadeness that we're bringing forward. And there was a, a notion that um, we're not we're not putting together pieces of parts that are that are coming out of the industry standards that these things are extremely personal and private and there's a handmadeness to them and you can feel handmadeness meaning that you can feel the human character behind the work you can you can sense the, the, the person right that's making this right and then there are these various kind of opportunities along this certain topic. Oh, I should say that um, in locating and uh, discussing this in four places, it's completely kind of a method of discussing the thing. It doesn't happen this way. It happens organically. The things that we're gonna talk about, they're all happening simultaneously, right? But so we're getting another project and it's a, it's a cafe. And then all of a sudden the material gets interesting. It's two dimensional. It's figurative, it's a painting. Um, 
and we're now dealing with the tension between a spatial, a spatial thing and a two-dimensional painting and a very different notion of materials is getting more ephemeral. And then again, in, in, for SHR, for an ad agency, we're using their material as building. And so we're moving way away from the, from the, the, the traditional notion of material and substance the material is being something much more ephemeral and something um, that um, has a very different notion of making space that has nothing to do with weight of the substance, et cetera, but is extremely specific to the nature of the work we're doing. And again, it starts with um, all the work and what you're doing, it starts with questions. And the difference of your work, the difference of our work is, um, is the questions we ask and how we kind of investigate from the very early part of the project of the nature of the project, if we're interested in um, a direct connection to um, solving a, a specific problem, and they're gonna be extremely different as we go from one to one. And then we had this extremely kind of interesting opportunity that came from some of this stuff that there, we're, we're producing an environment for the Chalorais Dance Company. And the notion now is we have, the materiality is receiving images and it's moving and it's, um, instigating or it's interacting with the choreography and ended up being an incredibly kind of interesting piece. It was, we opened the, uh, the Venice Biennale <clears throat> that the chore I'm working with the choreographer and we're developing the movement that's producing ideas of, move, of movement for the dancers or the dancers are, are producing movement of the piece and there's this reciprocity, this continued connection, this relationship between the environment and the dancer. And then again, and these, there's these kind of opportunities that come up in this kind of odd thing. It's a cafe in New York, and it's um, we're, we're using um, the, the character, and um, this was really odd. It's the most personal way we're using literally his, his garment. I had a person go over, we're selecting things in his, 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 his wardrobe, and we're using that as a material to make this extremely kind of autobiographical thing. And then there's a shift in this material and construction of the, actually the way we make things. And again, we're recognizing um, the, um, a very simple little early project, and we're recognizing the, um, we're questioning the nature of kind of how, how architects draw things and, and, and produce a method that um, is gonna lead to the, through the constructional process. And it's um, taking us back, for me, it was in my childhood of making models, and I found it much more interesting the model, the way the models were made that I did, the way we make architecture, and it seemed like we had to just identify the, the various pieces and then show you how they go together in a very much more direct way. And this is interesting because it's um, 20 years later, we're gonna make buildings like this, and I'm gonna say at the very end, we don't do drawings anymore, and that whole cycle has changed right now, and it, 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 it was another 30-year 30, a 30 -year process. And then um, simple projects, but we're trying to, we're taking kind of responsibility. This is just even in kind of a simple wood frame kind of project, but we're, we're looking at the contribution of the various, even at the simplicity of the structure, how that contributes to the total thing as it interacts with concept and, and, and idea. And we're, um, we're trying to be very kind of precise about it, even if we're developing intentionally imprecise looking things, or things that are, have a different kind of notion of precision, but they're, they come out of discipline. And I think early on, I was um, probably influenced by the, the, the Miles Davis kind of thinking that they produce extremely complicated things, takes enormous amount of rigor, and you have to ramp up the structure if you expect to do something that has um, a more complicated structure. And then um, the project's getting larger. Oh. We're maybe third decade now, guys, and in terms of the connection with the school. Um, we're, we, we get this commission in, in, in Cincinnati and it ended up being really interesting, and later I'll talk about it in terms of context. And we're producing things conceptually that people are having time, Harvard hard time building, and in this case, a, our joint venture um, was struggling with conventional drawings, and we were just getting, the digital thing was just starting to happen. This is mid mid nineties, and um, it's now absolutely necessary that we take responsibility for construction to build the nature of the, the ideas they were producing. 
right? And then there's no choice, and it's going to complete. It's going to start changing the studio, and it's going to start advancing the studio that from designers to a much broader um, multiplicity of tasks that's required for producing complex architecture. And then mm, X years later, um, we're we're working on a, this very kind of interesting project in, in China, and. Um, Construction is advancing into a much more complex state, and the industry now, in some ways, is ahead of architects. And we're responsible for understanding how to make a complex thing. And this could be something now with um, tens of thousands of parts that are all differentiated. Right? And we're we now have the capability to, to operate at that level. But this could be very much now more and more integrated in the design process, and that's going to continue as we go through this. And it allows us to, um, and we're taking responsibility for the method of construction of our ideas, right? We're, we're, it's, it's connected. And then again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue now in the studio, and it's going to start becoming um, institutionalized, really, in, in, in the studio, that um, we're producing a facade, and we're now at the subcontractor at Gates Construction in Texas. And in a way, we're expanding the design process through construction. We're, we're, we're still designing, we're still thinking, right? And we're, we're part of that, and we're taking not only responsibility for the, the methods, but it's part of a creative process. That we're still rethinking things and that are leading us into certain sorts of objectives that have to do with this. Ooh, ooh, and I'm missing that one. And then this, something else happened that was enormous here, and I would think for a lot of the young people, um, this might be really useful, and if I was going to start a career at this point, I would, I would be thinking about this. Um, the, the last image, well, the one up on the right, is an ad in uh, Architectural Record. They're selling our skin, and it's six months before the building opened. And my wife, who's my truthometer in the middle here, <laughs> we were joking, and she, of course, is all over me. It's Tom, you're, you're such an idiot in terms of a businessman. Um, it's our product, and, and they're, they're selling something we've done right before the building ends. And then I go, okay, um, not unusual today. It's the way Elon Musk will operate with Tesla. You make something and you produce it, and, and you, 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 get, you, you get compensated for your creative activity, right? It makes sense, right? And this is something that um, I, think it's, it's gonna be, I think in the future is going to be more and more kind of obvious that as we get more and more embedded in, in, in the building process. And then again, this is going to continue. So at Emerson, we're um, now at, at working on metal skins. Even closer. Huh. Does that mean that no one's there? I didn't think I said no one's there. Do I have to start from scratch? <laughs> we're we're, we're um, at Zaner, and we're now working with various types of facades and skins. And the design process is absolutely as much in his studio as it is ours. And we have our people embedded there, and we're inventing something, right, through the constructional process and taking incredible responsibility. So the, the thing in the middle, the maps, we're literally telling people how to put various elements on the building and we map it for them, right? And again, um, I should say that a lot of this is very much connected to being an American architect. This wouldn't happen in China. Mm, I don't know, it wouldn't happen in Japan, it wouldn't happen in Europe, but this is a country that's fairly unsophisticated. That I, I see myself now at this point, I look back and I, go, I can really differentiate being an American architect working in this country vis-a-vis -vis other places that you have to do this. And then again, it allows us to produce a certain level of complexity and a certain level of, again, that handmadeness, that uniqueness, that specificity, and we're now more and more interested in facades that have three dimension, and they're they're uh, um, environmentally operational, and they're um, they're singular. They belong to a, a one piece of work, and they're original. And again, in Korea, <clears throat> we're now kind of moving into way more complicated materials. We're increasing the scale, and we're working with a group of people that are extremely kind of interested. We're prototyping. The first prototypes came out of my our studio, and then after that, the prototype side of theirs, and we're producing this, this, this very kind of complicated skin. And then mm, this is going to move into kind of environment because it's going to have very much to do with skin, and I've updated the uh, Jim Dine um, with David Byrne, but the, more and more, and a huge amount of work today, the skin is going to become the kind of understanding of the reading of the work, and the, the work itself could be quite generic, 
And so it's taking a, a much more kind of prominent role. And I'm not sure this is a good thing or a bad thing. It's just, it's just what it is. And um, these people came to it for Korea, and, and they had this kind of generic building. And in fact, it was kind of a skin. And I remember going back and forth, which you would take the job or not. We took the job, but then the skin started informing the body, and it got much more specific. And it was much more interested in context, et cetera. But again, um, the making of it was absolutely kind of fundamental and the understanding of it to this the nature of this particular piece of work. And now it's going to become kind of a, an absolute, uh, as the work is getting larger, um, the performance is becoming much more important. The constraints of the work are becoming much more powerful. So in, in, in the, um, and in Caltrans, um, it's going to be an operational skin. It's going to be very much about performance. And we're working for the state of California. We're representing a building that represents a, a modern thinking of sustainability. And then you get to San Francisco, and we're kind of upping the ante a bit. <clears throat> and again, it's going to go right back to those first projects. We're kind of making stuff in a very kind of specific way, right? And it's um, the scale's increasing, and the importance or understanding of the technology is in, in the the intelligence of the technologies is, ramp is ramping up. And now we're dealing in um, hugely important kind of performance things. I remember just before this, um, we're getting hammered by the press as being um, kind of overly formal and overly complex and not dealing in kind of serious issues, but there were little projects that they, they didn't have these, these issues of failure. And when we came to these projects, it became evident they were now dealing with much more kind of substantial kind of uh, issues that, that architects can deal with. And in this case, we, we, um, we produced the first tall building with the air conditioning and the scan of that, that was a ma major part of this. And the, uh, the delta in energy equals a community of 24,000 um, 24, houses. It's really powerful, right, one building. And then in the, the far tower, um, produced, continued these ideas, but something a little more lyrical, we tried to, we're, we're, we're trying to repress the, 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 uh, the performance part of it and the functional part into something um, it, that has a very different reading. And now it's just going to become standard. And it's all going to have to do with um, differentiation, with finding um, very different kind of methods of this, 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 this skin, in this case in Cornell. And it's going to play a very different role, but it's going to be juxtaposed to the historical abilities of Cornell, et cetera. And then in some cases, in the the second Hoopa building in Uden, Italy, they're, they're isolated, and the skin now is a kind of an autonomous piece. Okay, um, second second category, and I've used up 25 minutes. It's supposed to be 15. <laughs> um, kind of the kind of heart of, by the way, I'm, I'm using, um, I don't do this often, um, I'm talking personally at this lecture, so it's going to be me. And I work collectively. And there's a lot of people here. And I've worked collectively from the very beginning. And um, all of the work has to do with a, a dialogue of a group of people I've worked with. But in this particular time, I'm talking about it personally in mine. But um, um, I was introduced to some of this. The first image is, is Chaco Canyon when I was an undergraduate. And it's something, the, the, kind of the only thing I took with me from USC it was this, this thing that came from this water structure. And it immediately kind of connected to. Um, to Nazca and it connected to Heiser. We just went out to see a city and it's kind of really amazing. I'd recommend it. And um, uh, the whole kind of rethinking of, um, of, landscape, of landscape, because I would have said that the, um, one of the most fundamental questions of the 21st century will be how the, um, we reconceptualize the dialogue between nature and, and man made construction. And um, it's going to be hugely influenced on our work. And we're going to right away go through a series of projects where a landscape becomes the, the derivation of the first thinking of the project. And architecture is repressed to some degree to follow the demands of a landscape idea. The first one had to do with scale and a gatehouse, and then a couple residences, and then this, the Chiba project. And it's, um, it definitely was one of those times that pushed us in a very different direction. It's going to have influence on kind of all the work we're doing. And then with that, um, uh, it's approached within urban projects, which is even more significant in terms of the, uh, the, the relationship of scale. And, um, and then I should say, with that, speaking to you students, um, we're, we're testing larger projects that aren't available to us yet. 
but it's a testing ground for things we're going to do in the future, right? And so we're working on um, um, various competitions, and we're starting to get places and winning some of them, et cetera. And it's just a, a big point, and this is taking place simultaneous, right, to the work on much smaller scale buildings, but ends up being incredibly important to kind of where you end up a decade later. And then we get just, I guess, somewhat lucky. We, we get this, we won a competition for a high school in, in LA. And, and um, the one over my head on the left, we showed the client the kind of forming landscape. And they actually didn't kick us out of the room. And we kind of continued to work on this project. And, and it's, but the whole notion is um, the questions we were asking, they, they began with how does architecture participate in, edu in education of, of, of a group of people at this age group? And can architecture have um, a role in uh, participating in that educational process? And it had to be something didactic. It had to be something kind of very clear. They were doing something that they could, that would preoccupy them or they demand them to kind of rethink the nature of what architecture is <clears throat> in terms of definitely um, land and building, in terms of uh, geometry and mathematics, et cetera, et cetera. And it ended up being quite successful that, oh, and it was, um, it very intentionally had urban aspects. They were interested in the, in the relationship of student to student, and it needed to be a much more kind of an East Coast thing, a much more urban thing, and not part of the suburban kind of mentality of, of Southern California. And then again, in a, a project in, um, in, um, in, in Austria, um, which is, by the way, as a side, as a bank, which is really interesting in a conservative country. And, it's maybe it'd be another kind of topic, but um, we're using land form and urban form, and it's a connection between uh, the relationship of, of, of rural and urban as it comes together, and it was this edge site that kind of triggered this idea where typology and morphology or the, the emptiness of the land was we wanted to kind of leave that, that feeling of emptiness of, of landscape with the urban condition. And then um, we got a project that really allows us to kind of expand this idea and to really explore um, uh, a, very, um, a very clear idea of, of, of an architecture which is both typology and morphology, which completely blends or produces a hybrid between landscape and building, because everything you're looking at is green, is building, it's all program. And, um, and the one that's um, very, very didactic, this is a research institute, institute in a, a working environment, and um, one that absolutely kind of connects these two ideas. And we were interested in, um, the question was, the, the simplest way, what does the 21st century sustainable architecture look like? Simple as that. And we're really looking at something that we, we think is, is kind of an idea, and then it's going to form public space, urban space, it's, it's um, organizing a large, it's a building just under a kilometer, a, a large a series of buildings. It's a little piece of a city, maybe. You could talk about it in those terms. And um, the movement will be all connecting interior, exterior, and it's going to be um, a complete uh, blending of that kind of environment between indoors and outdoors and landscape and, 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 and building. And it's... Um, it's it's gonna it's gonna be a blur. It's gonna be all about augmented landscape. And there's places where you see the, the, the people sitting. The, the, the earth is lifting off of you, and you're you're aware that you've made this new kind of landscape of which you're occupying this this under ter territory. And then um, it's infrastructure, and um, the whole complex is kind of open for interpretation. So this is their interpretation of yours, and it happened to be quite useful because the discusses the, uh, the single line is one of the connecting tissues and the organizational tissues right, of, this, of this complex. And then again, in a, another building for uh, the Hoopa people, we're, we're using landscape and land position. We're now occupying new layers of the land that become the public space. And it's going to guide you to an understanding of the communication of the building from inside to outside and, and vice versa. And um, it's um, going to follow us, and, and again, uh, it's, it's going to be something we're going to look at again as we, as we look at the multiplicity of landforms that we can now occupy as we, as we, as we, um, um, 
as we use the interstitial programmatically that goes way back to the competition I showed you, right? And then um, I thought this is what I wanted to talk about in a very different way. Um, because it's a resonance, and it's going to have to do with a very different idea of scale. And it's really based somewhere on a critique of critics um, that I find that we're at a period of time where critics want to talk about the look of a building, and they kind of write an opinion on it, that they like it or don't like it. And I find it just a complete waste of time, absolutely meaningless time. And nobody cares if you like or don't like something physically, whatever. If you like the particular thing, it has to be some broader, deeper kind of thing we have to talk about if we're going to have a profession of architecture, not just the look. We're not cake decorators, right? And so I'm showing this because it's a, a single family house, which we, and they talk about, well, I made it hard to talk about the look. This is South Elevation, right? Um, and it's a residence, and I find residential work at this point in my life, very, very different than other work. And then it's very, very private, right? And in our case, um, like mm -hmm. that privacy includes its openness or closeness to, to society. So that you, you have to pass a threshold and you, you the right to move in it. Very Parisian, maybe, much more kind of structured, right? In terms of that. But what's really important, um, parallel to this, um, I'm heading up uh, a, a study of the grand challenges of the UCLA, and we're looking at a very, very broad, usually funded kind of project that's looking at uh, the, the future of Los Angeles in terms of sustainability. And um, I'm looking at the statistics, and what's so important about this house, as we talked about, if, it's, if it is important, is the understanding that LA, um, um, a city of 18 plus or minus million people, 2,300 uh, square miles, um, uh, 134 different township is made up of um, nine and a half million little increments that we call houses. And if you look at that, the, the, the effect on that with um, the sustainability, if you look at H2O, you look at water, uh, that accounts for 54% of our total water use. And if you look at energy, it, in, it includes 20% of our total energy use. And the discussion would be, um, I would think, the one of the things that absolutely would be essential for us that we understand that and that to make this part of a broader notion would have enormous implications. And it'd be the way Musk will talk about the automobile, if he was the, the single automobile is worth 54% of the total pollution causing. And you can translate that into billions of dollars that could be to, to, to healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we have to think in those terms. And it, 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 makes it, it makes smaller projects extremely important as, as larger projects. And uh, what you get out of that is the, also is the reflection of nature. It's not only about the formal ideas. It's about constantly getting reinforced. And, oh, it's so too bad. I was told this is supposed to move, guys. <laughs> then you can, you, can, you can spend hours just understanding the beauty between the relationship between a dynamic environment and landscape as, it, as, it's, as you re you're building a, a receiver for that, right? And it, it definitely is going to affect your other thinking formally, right? The things that are absolutely uh, of, of a different nature that are artificial. Okay, context. Um, this is, this is for me a very, very complicated. And again, con context is going to be in the broadest sense. Context, not just in terms of uh, the, the physical environment, but the broader context of the problem to the specificity of the kind of problem you're looking at. And, and, and I'm going to always kind of hover my own just between total non sequiturs and collisions that seem like accidents, because I'm going to, I'm going to, end, I'm going to end with that. And um, that I, I've been fascinated with um, a radical heterogeneity of things as they, as they, they, as they come together in, in, a, in an odd way. And the opposite, the, the history of boundary and definable urban places. Of the, 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 the one of the middle, the, um, the, 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 the housing in, in Kowloon, I happened to go to 20 years ago, and it's absolutely an amazing place. You just, it's a free form 
in a piece. And it was just totally amazing. And again, the other one, we were just in Noto in, in Sicily. And again, the contained kind of the, the absolute um, clarity of that, which is no longer possible. I'm, but I'm interested in, in, in challenging these then, the two things as they, as they intersect. And from the very beginning, we were challenging um, private, public, and the, um, the limited, uh, or the, the, the role of boundary between private building and public street. And we were interested in making the connection of these things. And it started with our building in Toronto. It is really interesting because the, uh, the university asked us, it was, it's on the main street of Toronto, Spadina, and it's the edge of Toronto University. And they asked us to make a gate. And we did this and thought it was just the most obvious thing in the world. We, we produced a gate and we were, eh, we're kind of having a good time. We put the zero in Toronto, it's like Bozai, and you can see it from two, two kilometers away. And uh, it, it possessed that. And then they were like, well, what's going on here? And we went back and just explained it in a very logical way. It's, it's, it's an entry point. And, and Toronto University is a bit like NYU. It's, it's, it's not Columbia, it's not gated. It's, it's kind of does this. And they, they want something that's a little clearer. And it was this extremely kind of obvious and, um, and again, in, in the, the Caltrans building, it, it has a plaza. And, uh, sounds, uh, I'm actually a very conventional architect. We, we built a piazza. We actually won the competition. It was the only one to build a public space. The problem being, of course, that LA has no interest in public space. And so we're building a public space prior to the desire of public space. And we're aware of that. Um, but we're convinced that. Um, that the, the, the simplicity of the necessity for human interaction is going gonna, is gonna, is, is gonna to be part of the city. Is it? Well, it's not quite a city. This is a kind of a large village. Again, this is a. Um, it's not. It hasn't arrived there yet. We're still like a conglomeration of these 134 different little townships, and it's a suburban place. And um, and then using certain particular ideas, the Hollywood sign, the two-dimensional. It happens to be its first in Maine. And so we're at the epicenter of downtown Los Angeles. And so it's 100 to 100, and it's just a kind of an obvious thing. But we're purposely using kind of the graphic, and we're using people as material as part of this. <clears throat> and we understand that um, we're going to have to activate this space. And we brought in Keith Nolle, and we worked with him on the light structure. And it had to be dynamic, because we're, we're giving some, something we think is going to be somewhat passive. or. Uh, it, it needs some energy. We're, we're, we're allowing the architecture to supply some of that. And then again in San Francisco, where we're starting a whole new district, and we have two different things. We're, we're producing an open space in front of the, um, the uh, uh, Ninth Court, uh, Circuit Court of Appeals, which is, if you're into that, it's, it's kind of a famous of all the courts. It's, it's the really kind of interesting one. And in, in an area that's kind of downtrodden, it's, it's a one singular kind of important piece, probably the most important piece of architecture in San Francisco. And we opened up a space to produce something clearly provocative or challenging the nature of the language, right? But it's going to be back to some of the other argument. It's going to have to do with performance and other series of things. And we're um, still convinced that architecture can shape behavior. And we're being very aggressive about the program. We did a, a study that came from, uh, from, from Harvard that talked about workspaces. And we moved the staff to the edges and the the management to the middle, and we added a daycare center after doing a research that 55% of the staff were women, and we put a daycare center in, and we were very, very active. And they were dealing with public space. And San Francisco is, is, is famous or known for its um, especially small scale public spaces and parks in the city. And so one of them was on the 11th floor, and it's for marriages and events for the public, and it's used for the public. But it gives at the same time, it allows the, the view, which we thought was, again, in San Francisco, it was kind of obvious, et cetera. And, uh, and then with that came workplaces. And we were very on hunching that workplaces are going to be less and less specific, that they, they have more to do with um, Inter interconnection and, 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 and very much a series of very casual places through the building. And one of them were these pieces that you can see come out of the building where you're floating over the plaza that ended up being ex extremely kind of useful. And then again, a, um, a presence of the, um, of the main space. It's the main federal building, and it's a 200 year whatever building. I mean, it, we wanted to have. Um, Mm, it goes back to the materiality now. It wanted to have a substance, 
and a, 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 a conceptual way as well as a kind of in realistic. And then with that came a language, which I'm going to get to at the end, that has to do with a, a, an idea of a, a new notion of part whole and a series of elements that make up a kind of a totality of something. And then um, a building in Paris, and it's um, all made out of constraints. Um, a non-site where you had to invent something that was in no way, uh, in any way prototypical or, or, or typical for this kind of project that allowed us to produce this very, very different building in La Defense, which is at the edge, and we, defined, we, we, we dealt with it, the understanding of that edge, and that was going to be just uh, a meter shorter than the Eiffel Tower, which is a distant, was a was an interest by the, by, the, by the Parisian government, and would give us these types of views of the city. And um, it's going to be where uh, an a prior idea is affected by the reality of the constraints. And for me, it's the most interesting project. I, I, constraints are, are, are everything. If, if, it's, if it's totally your work, and I'm going to get to the end of that, I'm going to discuss it again. It's, it's, it's thinner, and you need the, um, the, uh, inter, the interaction of, of other forces that really give you the things that are the most kind of unique and the most kind of profound. And again, tall buildings are really tough to make. When you're talking about context, um, this one, we, we, we developed something where every floor is a, a different floor plate and different scale, and, and it still kind of opens up on the ground that, that, that deals with the, the demand for commercial and the majority of the space on the ground floor. But, but they're difficult, and mm, but what we did do is um, we were, Kind of getting tired of shapes, and the, the, my trips to Shanghai and, and Shenzhen, I started joking with my people that you'd look around, and um, I needed to bring some interns with me to literally draw every one of them. As I, I, can't, I, I started leaving there thinking, is there, is there a shape that hasn't been built yet? And it's not something I'm kind of interested in making the, the, the hundreds, the two hundreds, the three hundred shape. And we got involved in actually building something kind of much leaner, but the notion was was moving from your domestic life to the work life, and you cross these bridges at the 80th floor, and we're highly in, involved in the urban, uh, urbanity of the city, right? And um, you're, you're uh, the threshold of going to work and leaving work had to do with this understanding of the city and this kind of positioning of space, and it ends up being the, the tallest steel structure in, in, um, in China and the tallest remote vertical structure and then we're in Casablanca, and it's really strange for you to say, what, what does it have to do with context? We're the beginning of a new La Défense. And in the context, this could be much more literally architecture. And I'm looking at the modernists that showed up in Casablanca, a really an amazing little place in the 50s. And it includes Shad Woods and some really interesting people. And I'm, I'm using that language and in, in, in part of the continued architectural language of, of uh, Casablanca that these people started. And then we get this really, really interesting thing, the competition we won, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tower in Vals, um, Switzerland. And Vals is a, um, a village of 700 people, and it's an eighth century town. And um, we put this tower in, and um, it's, it's, the presentation is gonna be in New York, and there were a whole group of people coming, they were ready to, 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 to really kind of attack this thing, because it's gonna be the tallest building in Europe. And we produced this model that showed the site and the building on the right. And I think you can see the tower if you look really hard, it's there. And it was, this would be, again, something, it would be a longer discussion, but for your students, I would think that your generation can become much more tactical. And um, you, you move beyond um, describing the project in terms of just what it is, but you have to discuss a broader thinking of, of, of um, um, it's it's re, it, it's relation. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, your ability to, to to produce this given kind of obvious problems because this one, uh, when we built the model, we purposely didn't even build the hotel as a total thing. We only showed this because they had a group of press coming that were going to trash the building and sale. They could say nothing. There was nothing to say, and, and I actually sent the photograph of the person photographing, sent a staff to photograph the site and put the building in it, and it's actually a, a piece of sculpture. And it's this most minimal thing, right, in this context, right? So the context actually became everything in this project. We're still looking at this one. This is going to take forever to go through the, the various governments. And now it changes a bit as you move into um, 
deeply cultural projects. So we're doing, we're working on the, uh, the Eugene Courthouse. Um, we're looking at a, a completely different project, which is um, about transformation, and it's about, uh, it's inventing originals that are, um, that are based on models that exist. And it literally is a piece of work that's um, shaped by belonging, continuities, connections, and um, with the American courthouse. And we had, we had uh, originally um, planned a, a, an elevation that was gonna have the, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the, 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 the community all was gonna put up our, a letter and they were going to kind of have ownership of this and we we couldn't have that and and it, it brings up another subject architects tend to get blamed a lot for for the social conditions of building and i'm going to say after 50 years of practice um that's not my take it's 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 the political community and the business community has a hard time with that because um, my, my sense is that it's, there's been a complete dead end at that level and there's especially in this country there's an incredible lack of interest in public Right? There just isn't a broad notion of, of a collective tissue in this culture. And then the inside, oh, and this was fascinating. I worked with Judge Hogan, the, the Chief Justice, for, for a year on this. <clears throat> and this was a project where you're faced clearly with politics. And we were discussing um, uh, a fixed idea of, of government and a, an open one. And we went at it for a year. And the thing that saved us was the French Bordeaux and we, we found other personal ways of, right, of dealing with that and uh, that got us here. But the whole inside was an openness and an, an unfinishedness that had to do with the arrival of the courthouse. And then when you got to the courthouse, we spent over a year of this. And I could tell you, I could talk to you about the bench, which was connected to a Midwestern Protestant church that's just not quite comfortable, but it's kind of purposeful in a sense. We, we tend a huge amount of time at an incredibly nuanced level on the history of the one-room courthouse in the United States. And I had somebody that was extremely interested, the, the judge, in, in the, um, a very literal notion of maintaining um, that kind of continuity, that type of connection with, the, with this country. And when you, when you understood the, um, the courthouse, it unfolded the whole project because it was really the courthouse that produced the, the whole life. So when you found the exterior, you recognize it was a series of these pieces and they all had to, and again, I could um, go back and talk about the courthouse and literally the window behind the judge, the, the, the light that se separated the defense and the prosecution that was talked about as a guillotine. I took him to France and showed him a Jean Nouvelle's thing and it was really hilarious. And it, we, we could, this is a, a two hour presentation. It's, it's incredibly kind of focused on you either say constraints or the requirements is you're interacting with your notions of architecture and your ability to put together a complicated problem within broad social, cultural, political framework, right? And again, with Cooper Union, a very different kind of problem, the most idiosyncratic kind of place in a way that, that puts together engineers, artists, and architects. And it happened to be, um, for Jim Stafford and I, when we were starting, when we were part of starting the school, it was the place I was looking at. In my mind, we were going to be something between the AA and the and the, uh, the Cooper Union at the time, as run by John Haydick, who was an incredibly powerful influence in all of us at the time, because he was also a kind of an ethical center, right? And he, he he had a very kind of unusual place that later developed the Lebius Woods and a whole series of characters that kind of don't exist anymore. But the notion was the um, producing something that that uh, had the energy of New York, which makes New York, New York, kind of the hyper energy, right? And, and so the huge amount of the building at the ground level is gonna it just describe that, that kinetic kind of thing. And then um, the, the main idea, when this one was so straightforward, um, we're in the East Village, um, eccentricity is kind of the commonality. Um, and, um, and then with that, uh, we're developing a campus, it's the second building, and it's about a social connected space, and it's about advancing dialogue between engineers, artists, and architects, and we make a vertical piazza for the 11 floors, <clears throat> and it's gonna be, it'll be shown on, on the exterior of the building as kind of the singular thing, because it's also open at night, you're seeing the people in, in that connectivity, and um, we're producing this vertical <coughs> public space. And again, um, with that comes a kind of a highly differentiated um, kind of language, 
that if, if you if you look at it, there's nothing systematic. Everything has, is is finding its own uh, kind of set of um, uh, relationship to a set of rules. And then there's a place that you understand the verticality, and there has to be one kind of memorable place, and it is the piece that's the connective tissue that represents the, um, the symbol of, of, the, of the school itself. And then again, at Caltech, it got really interesting. We were looking at a horizontal connecting to the campus and vertical connecting to the cosmos. And it was, um, we were, um, it, it, we, we, this, this one vertical element you're seeing on the, on the, on the right side, the, the public space, we were looking at kind of a particular um, constellation. And then later, uh, I'm working with um, Tom Phillips, who's the astrophysics that, that has this whole place. And he just laughed hysterically at my, my anavity, because in fact, if you look out of Hubble, it's a sea of a, a billion stars, and there is no object in the sky. It's an absolute map, right? And we didn't care. The, the normal person does. We were interested in the vertical connection, and we just used that as an idea. And in some ways, it does, somebody, this is a whole other discussion. The, the direct connection is also kind of a complicated conversation, because you can, you can be working on something that actually doesn't work, but it finds another way of communicating that's irrelevant, that it finally just produces something, and it doesn't matter whether it lives by the original rules, if that makes any sense. <laughs> and then again, um, in, in, um, in, in Emerson, uh, um, Sunset Boulevard, a series of non sequiturs, uh, um, uh, hmm, a connection, I'm showing you the, the, this thing with Dallas, because I love the, the, the kind of the, the stuff that comes with the city. This, um, and again, with our building, um, this radical connection between um, what? Absolutely kind of informal buildings with your work. And that's part of something, if you live in A, you, ac you accept. I remember talking to Ralphie Moneo when he was doing the church. And he wasn't, he shouldn't have been in LA. He couldn't deal with Los Angeles. He needed a real site, right? He needed, he was a Ken Frampton uh, a character, right? That need, needs uh, critical regionalism, all that. And um, in LA, you get used to this. So we'll come up again in a minute. And we're producing, um, it's a school that brings out their, their, their students for a semester, for a year uh, to Los Angeles. And we were interested in some sort of a Boston LA hybrid and we're going to produce kind of congested accidental spaces out of that. And then there's a whole series of things I could kind of fill you in with. The, the, the public space becomes kind of the architecture and even kind of generic buildings is the thing in Korea. And uh, well, then mm, at, at Dallas, we have this really interesting problem. And this is where um, uh, we feel extremely comfortable. Um, we have a site, you can see the city. We have a site that's across the freeway that has nothing to do with a public site. And it's the major public building. It's a, a children's children's uh, science museum, and um, and and then you look at the pictures on the right. And the, what we did is we reconstructed the site. And this is going to again something that's going to stay with us now for the rest of the practice. And that we start by building site, and the site is considered um, the, the beginning action of building building. And we're building the site up to the freeway. And like LA, the real site is going to be the height of the freeway, and it's going to be seen like you're seeing it here. And it's going to be constructed out of landscape. And now we're going to connect to some things you saw later on with the, the landscape architecture connection. And we're going to construct the, we're going to reconstruct the site. It's a thicker site that both brings it up to the freeway and then accommodates all the functions that want to be on the first floor. So pragmatically, they bring totally in alignment. And then on top of that will be this more, the, the simpler kind of Cartesian thing. And, um, and we're, trying to allow the user, mm, you're going to enter the space and it's vertical again. This could be a little bit parallel to, to Cooper. And then we have the, the vertical connection of, of the museums itself. And we're taking responsibility for the public spaces. The rest of them are black boxes. It's not about architecture. And, and as you move up, you're connected to the city. And we're visually connecting it to the, to the center of the city, even if, in fact, we're disconnected and we're across the freeway. And it's absolutely, it could be in Los Angeles, Dallas, Houston. It's the modern city. And mm, that reinforces um, a total lack of any conventional interest, which is interesting. The city doesn't want to give it up for various economic reasons to give it the site it really wanted, which would be on a, on a, on a, on a public space in the city. And it's fascinating. You come in, and you're supposed to be the radical or the 
or the, what are, you know, the, the, the formal one that's overturning things or provoking people, and it's quite the opposite. Half the time we come in, same with the, court, the courthouse, they're gonna say the same thing. <laughs> and movement became everything. And the elevators we designed to hold 30 people, that's a class, a classroom. And they bring in the school bus, they bring in um, uh, three of these at a time, and it became part of that. We were aware that they're gonna be seeing each other as they move, and it was just a really opportunity. And then um, a recent project that just got finished, the, 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 the Orange County Museum. And um, these comments will also be for critics. Um, they seem to want to talk about the building and what it looks like, the formal stuff, or that it's not finished. Um, we, we tried to demote the building. It was about producing a public space. And what was interesting about this project, that, um, that that's, for any of you, this would be a project that you'd, you'd love to have. It's about city building. We're in a um, one of the suburbs that's advancing from village to town to, to city to the right to the urban, and um, this comes with it, a museum. And they built the music hall, and they built the, the opera hall, and the museum is next. And it, we worked on this for 15 years, and we didn't work on a design. We worked with the development of a group of people that are trying to put together this institution, which is a normal process of city making. And after our Dallas project, we had produced, the, out of the conversation there, we produced a very large public space, and it ended up becoming extremely useful as a connector to the city. And they had all kinds of events there, and some of those people ended up being on the board, being contributors, et cetera, et cetera. And it became a complete important model for that project. And we brought that to this. And what they needed, they're looking for an audience. Right? It doesn't exist. And we're, we're, we're building up I, um, um, an institution that, and, and again, it took 15 years where things lined up, where they had the, the resources to build this, et cetera. But what we did is we built them a public space and tried to demote architecture, trying to find a very different type. We didn't want to talk about it as yet another kind of strong piece of architecture as an object. We're not interested in that whatsoever. We were interested in a public space. And it, it seems to be doing exactly what we thought. They have all kinds of events there of people. I mean, it's Pompidou. If you know the Pompidou conversation, it was designed that you come up and get a cheap fruit on the top. And they, they actually did studies. And 6% of the people the first year walked in and looked at the art. They're finding a new, right, a new audience. In the second year, it was 12%. And they kept, they kept doing that for years. And finally, it was the population of France and that whole thing, right? It was a really fascinating conversation. This was Pompidou. We're, we're, this is this is building. Whoop, this is building um, building an institution, and there the, the, it has multiple events, and we're building a public space for this. Well, it's kind of a weird community, a series of towns in LA. You can't differentiate them for this kind of district of Los Angeles, and it became a really fascinating project at that level. And then it has kind of a piece that you enter, and it seems again somehow that the, the, the writers want to be preoccupied with a critique of this, but to me it'd be secondary. This is, yes, we're architects and we produce space and you can like it or not like it. And, and it, it wanted to have a certain energy and it has this interest we've had for X amount of years, right? But I think the, the bigger question should be the, the, the reality of, of how it's helping build a community. And then again, in Korea, something that was just a really kind of a nice opportunity, a very unusual client that's building a research center and he wanted a public space that really responded to the his sense of his whole community and all the public functions and the, 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 uh, the, um, uh, the cafeterias and anything to do with public was on one side of the building. So everybody kind of came to this space every day and then they, they participated in the park and, and, and the, the view of the building. And, and, and at the same time, I'm separate, again, I can't separate these. We're making the facades out of the, they, they, um, they research high tech facades. You're, um, Airbag or steering wheel comes from these guys, that kind of thing. And we were using their material to make the fabric of the space. And so it was kind of highly kind of connected to this nature of uh, this particular institution. And then again, in much more obvious sense, um, on, the, the, on the left, you're looking at what the University of Cincinnati was whispering in, um, whatever, uh, design architects. And it started out with Peter Eisman, and they were, they were, it was a time when they were thinking of building icons, and architecture was going to participate in advancing the status of the university, kind of a, 
and then a kind of a long kind of a conversation about that one. And by the time we got there, they decided that that wasn't where they wanted to go, and they're interested in connectivity, and they had no longer an interest in building more. And we had this project that was building a uh, an urban street that connected the old and the new campus, and it was also um, integrating living, study, recreation, food services, infrastructure into one complex in the middle of the campus. It was, a, it was a very different kind of model, but we're building um, public, and um, it gave us this kind of really interesting opportunity. And again, um, housing, again, so many of these would be complete conversations here you could have for an hour. If you look at the housing group up in LA right now, the, the concrete with the wood on top, absolutely ridiculous kind of stuff, right? This is, it's, it's about investment, it has nothing to do with living in any sense. This is, a, this is in Madrid. And we were challenging the, um, the institutionalized housing type of a block and trying to find a, a, a new organizational idea that had to do with um, something much more kind of humane and something much more connected to a housing model, right? And that, that, that um, challenged the, the notion of uh, the, the institutional notion of the block and the quarter, interior, et cetera. And we also, by doing that, we could form neighborhoods. We spent a huge amount of time there, 14 unit neighborhoods, and it was very, very much part of the culture. And we used um, influences from the Moorish influence in the uh, 12th, 13th century. The Moors had found their way all the way up to to, to La Tourette, to La Tourette, to Tours, et cetera. And we were using a lot of that in terms of the communi communication of walking streets, et cetera, the scale, et cetera. They became kind of useful. And then more recently, um, a, a project for uh, ENI, it's, a, um, it's their campus. And as part of a, a community of San Donato, which has been going on since the 30s, and it's a, um, it's going to use, it's, it's the main oil uh, company in, 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 um, in, in Italy. And we used a geological stratification as a broad kind of an idea. And we discussed, and we did some kind of work of oil being kind of part of the organic matter that has be between these stratas. And we use that as a kind of a nice idea. And then we, um, we produce this. And it's, um, City making. We're building a, a chunk of, of an urban complex, and again, it's based around a, a public space. And we we won it based on that. We were the only one that did that. Everybody had objects still, and um, they were interested actually in the connective tissue, and in the the social structure. And mm, you'll see on the slide on the right, we're still that hand maintenance is still found its way and rooted in the office. We're still kind of making this stuff, right? And um, it's, it's nothing is off the shelf. And then we have um, scale opportunities now, which are just really kind of take us a different place, right? And, um, and then a, uh, an exhibit hall in Nanjing, which is, uh, again, it's at the beginning of a new part of the city. And again, a, a huge amount of the, the thinking is going to be in the public quarter and the, the, the architecture that's going to be very kind of dynamic will be the, in part of the connective tissue. Uh, uh, I I'm, can't show just about anything of this. This is a, a, a this is the embassy in Beirut, and I can because I'm running out of time here. It's um it condenses kind of everything I've talked about. Um, it's a very very large project. It's a piece of a, a city. It's the largest embassy in in this area. It's a um, a project that's been taking place for eight years. It's two years old. I can't. I can only show this photograph. It's uh, it's highly kind of secret still, but it's an incredibly kind of interesting project, and we're um, it's literally going to be kind of a fabric that's part of Beirut. And if I could show you other slides, it's going to feel like both a provocation and something that's absolutely kind of inevitable and part of the city if it's if we if we get it done right. And it's become absolutely a fascinating project. And again, um, uh, uh, for me, and again for your students, I would think that. Um, the, the most interesting projects, the most compelling projects of this century are going to have to do with in, continual increase of scale and complexity. And this is going to be common. And, and the scale of the project actually in China is actually not even unusual today. These would be projects that would be very kind of straightforward. And then um, any number of projects that I can't show in the short period of time. Again, this has been 50 years, guys. <laughs> it's kind of a lot of time. That they're going to have the ideas I'm talking about that have to do with specificity, et cetera, that have to do with the um, developing um, 
uh, challenging, hmm, attempting not to get a self-similarity in work and to define the uniqueness that is connected to each project, that it has that specificity. And then finally, um, the formal, and I'll just do this really quickly, and this is even, this is kind of the one that's the kind of the easiest and maybe the kind of the most fascinating. Um, we're in Los Angeles. So the, you're looking at the Level House, and, and Level House was finished, by the way, um, a year before Villa Savoy, and um, the, these are kind of the models of course, for practice in LA, you cannot not be aware that you are now part of a, of a, of a, of a uh, a system of making buildings, and you're part of that community, right? That, that started with Schindler and Neutra, right? And it's a, it's, it's, it, it's just you are somehow going to progress hmm. using that as a foundation or part of a foundation. You are now part of that project, which is bigger than you, right? And you're just fi finding your way within this 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 mass project, and so you can immediately connect Level House and Savoy. And then hmm, I came across this recently, and um, it's Sharoon. Do you guys know this thing? I just came across, I was blown away. And then, it, then I, it, I was gonna go, okay, I've got to talk tonight. Um, I started out in a very naive way, thinking that we were kind of radical architects, and I was interested in that kind of provocation, kind of following the, the 20s guys. Um, that's not even close to what I think today. It's evolutionary, not revolutionary. And I look at this, and I really scratch my head. I'm 1933, I believe, and I'm going, hmm, um, kind of where, how far have we come, or what have we been doing? And, and it seems like we are moving at an evolutionary pace, and we could have a long conversation of kind of where we've gone from this building. And then, of course, um, uh, Kiesler and uh, the Ben Bermars were just around that they, you, you knew that as a young person, and it establishes the breadth or the, 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 uh, the reach that architecture has. I never become that interested in either of these, but I, they're there and I understand they offer kind of an opportunity of the, the, the distance you can move, right? And that's, again, that's happening in the, in, the, in, in the 30s and 40s. And then what really got me going, the slide on the extreme right, um, I came across that 40 years ago and became just fascinated with the organizational idea in here and in that piece. And I thought it was a, um, a photograph of a, of a lunar surface or something, and it's a micro cell of an onion skin. And I've been fascinated with this organizational idea, and then I put it right next to a current photograph of the, the moon that's actually from Russia that just crashed, and I'm not interested in that one. And then with that is, 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 um, is um, Hilbertsheimer, and it was the beginning of my career that I was, I was resisting the self-similarity and the radical simplicity of Hilbertsheimer. And I'm connecting Hilbertsheimer with the, the microcell. It's been my project for, for, for 40 years. And then um, the beginning, your, um, your drawing. The um, drawing is thinking. It's, um, it's pursuing work foreign to language. Um, I'm very suspicious of all language trying to describe architecture because I'm interested in architecture as an art form that's indescribable. It only operates in its own terms, right? You have to understand it, and language can only work around it, and it'd be no different if you're trying to describe um, Miles Davis or Polonius Monk or go to every year musician. Um, but it's, it's completely kind of focused on that. And um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's potential is to produce things that are not buildable, that are, um, that are independent from realization. Um, it, it allows you to, to, to move to a, a trajectory of moving someplace that you're trying to reach is in some cases uh, um, not reachable. And um, it's therapeutic. It's my escape from the day-to-day -day world, and it's my survival. Simple as that, right? It's not. It's, it's inescapable. And sometimes it develops work um, that becomes your your identity, and that um, 
uh, through my whole practice, I've always had a ambivalence between the, the work you invent through this kind of medium and the built work. I mean, there's times when I would want to stop at the built work or I think it's going to be compromised by building and I'm totally happy with stopping and not building it, not totally consumed that you have to build things. It has to do with the protection of your own ideas or your own identity with the work in terms of how you give it importance, importance personally. <clears throat> and then there's going to be a direct connection, of course, between the work now is a part of a developing methodology. It's, it's driven by a, a process driven and it's giving you um, very particular rules and it's, um, it, it's giving you a very particular discipline in terms of the ideas you're pursuing. And at the beginning, it very much had to do with notions of collage and had to do with multiple forces, et cetera. And, um, but all of it is interested in a, um, a polycentric methodology, multiple systems operating. And at some point, it get clear that we were challenging very basic notions of part whole. And we're developing notions where the part is now has an autonomy and there's multiple elements that come from different systems that um, uh, are um, producing a new concept of whole. And that systemization had to do with, again, as we're producing through, through this, this series of experiments, um, it includes the site of the building, and it definitely connects directly to the conversation that I have with, with, with the Heisers, <coughs> et cetera, um, that we're, we're um, the, the, the abstraction of the work, which is the beginning of the work in the abstraction, is now colliding and, and aligning with the various kind of functionalities of the project. And then that organizational idea is moving towards more and more kind of clear definition of, of, of uh, differentiation. And I'm interested in producing environments which are coherent, but don't use any of the traditional rules of, of repetition, um, uh, axial alignments, et cetera, et cetera. And that follows a much more biological model, let's say, which is going to be kind of a continued interest. And then, mm, this is probably late 90s, mid late 90s, the computer shows up and um, things are now changing radically in, in um, uh, in terms of our ability to kind of produce complex, complex organizations. And two things are happening. One, um, you can look at something conceptually and then crawl in it and deal with it perceptually, and that's huge. You can actually understand the thing in perceptual terms. And um, um, it's, it's uh, increasing or challenging the notion of organization again, it is becoming much more connected to association of things that produce coherency. And um, it's taking us kind of to the next step. And then there's a, um, I'm starting a series of uh, three-dimensional paintings or objects or something, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking for um, um, advancing organizational ideas. And um, a, 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 I'm, I'm it's developed a very kind of disciplined notion that there's four elements that are being put together within a, a given kind of rigor. And I'm looking at the, the, number, the amount of diversity, the amount of options that I can get out of that kind of, out of that, that condition. And this could be directly connected to um, um, the need for more complex organizational ideas. And, I, and I, I, one quote here I just found, I just I had to read it. Um, it's, it's, it's from the Smithsons. And it's, just, it's their, their very famous one. Instead of aiming to achieve a totalizing program which utilizes a single idealized system, an urban field made up of various layers, each layer on its own domain governed by its own law. That was written in 1944. It's my birthday. I'm working on that project and it requires that precedent to understand that, right? And I think that'd be one of the kind of the broader conversations here would be um, locating at this time in history, territories that still represent collective projects. Because if we keep working independently, we won't have a profession. We won't be needed. And it's starting to move towards the first thinking is three dimensional and the drawings come second. The drawings are now an analysis or CAT scans of, of the, the models I'm showing you. And, and then I'm comparing them to my own sketches and I'm trying to work on random um, 
working on producing accident, but within some consistent way that represents some sort of coherency. And then I'm comparing that to the, the tools I have available to me, and it ramps it up at powers of 10 in terms of my own ability to do this, right? But I'm, I'm still looking for the, uh, whatever the humanness is in the hand that, 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 that comes through, that gives you a certain type of a character or differentiation. I'm also can't, um, I'm struggling. I can't quite tell you what I'm trying to do. I'm, it feels comfortable, but I can't explain it, if that makes any sense. <laughs> and then I'm doing directly. So there's the, I'm ending up with this, and I'm finding direct connections to the organization of the, of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the giant project. And, and then you're looking at that one piece on the complete right. There's a, it, it's being found through a system. And I'm making a discretion of, yes, use this one and not that one. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to start challenging, like those parts did, authorship. Because I'm developing a system of making something, but I'm not making the thing itself. And I keep altering the system that makes it. And then I make decisions in terms of where we're moving in that process. And that's continuing as we now take the same things and script that I'm allowed to look at 100 different I got Dan here that does this stuff in front of me. <laughs> I can look at infinite numbers of options. And I'm old school trained when I was looking at designs of thing and I did a second one or a third one. I can now look at hundreds, right? And it allows me to radically expand kind of my thinking of where I'm going versus the mechanics of drawing something, right? All of it looking for systems. So, and again, I can in some cases, um, make direct connections. This is a competition we won for a park in Beijing. It's a, a square of three, three by three blocks. And I'm, I need a, a complex organizational structure that puts together something that's both um, building and, um, and park. And I'm trying to harness chaos, um, chance, synchronicity. I'm searching for the meaning of coincidence. That's Jung, right? And um, a, a very different kind of, much more complex kind of organization, which I think is in synchronization of types of problems that are in front of us. And again, in another cultural park in China, and it gives me an option to look at, um, in very rapid succession, I can look at variations on a particular idea, which advances my ability to kind of solve a problem, right, and the mechanics of that problem and then put it within kind of fixed terms. And so I'm looking at three pavilions who share the same language, and I'm looking three of infinity, right? And then that, with that comes now the, the relationship to, the, to the, the, the demands of the building, which become totally secondary. And then the last image, um, the, um, The focus on organization has to do with this kind of scale of thinking. And I, I'm convinced that this is going to be the continued most compelling project of this century. And it's city making, and it's working at larger and larger scales, and it's happening as we speak. It's already taking place. <coughs> and it's quite common today to get problems. Um, uh, Winkle Dubelbaum was just here for the reviews, and she was showing her latest project. It's a mile and a half long with two stadiums and a shopping center. And, and it's just, it's just, it's just a, a kind of a regular project today. It's kind of amazing. Um, I was in school when they were talking megastructures, right? And, and th that was my generation. And they were unbuildable. They were talking about as, as, as ideals. It was Tangi, right? And th today, it's, it's, it's a project. And I'm, I'm fascinated with um, kind of advancing our ability to have the terms to deal with these types of problems that finally, um, are building cities that have these immense qualities that come over centuries of construction and, and, and heterogeneous thinking, the, a Paris, a London, name your city. And today we have um, a year to develop some of those qualities. And, and we, it seems like we need to advance our techniques to give them or to have some notion of giving them the kind of the richness, the complexity, the characteristics that have that. And with me, they start with um, organizing chance, accident, et cetera, has is, is, is been the focus. Um, 
and it's going to con continue to be there. And then I want to remember, I have a, a quote here, but I don't want to quote it in this thing. Continuing the conversation about continuity uh, or precedent, um, I'm going to try to make an argument that we should be continuing, and it's going to be a, a, a it's going to depart from solar moralis. We had a, just a very, very late solar moralis, an incredible thinker. But um, his notion, my notion, we, we agreed on this, um, that there's no reason that we shouldn't be maintaining the foundation of early 20th century thinking. And that um, in our desire to, um, to restore um, a, 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 um, an ethical order, let's say, of the world, um, it starts by probably um, challenging or removing the, um, the utopianism and the reductivism of the project and to um, and to find a potential of simultaneously um, working with the specific and the um, and the mutable on one hand and the ideal on the usual on the other hand. Thank you so much.